So we're still doing Ephesians, but we're going to end with worship and communion. Um, we're going to end with worship, just, just yeah. worship him. So we're going to start with Ephesians chapter 4. Perhaps if I take the Bible right side up. I'll just, um, Ephesians chapter 4. Father, we just come before you and we thank you for the truth, the power, the authority of the Word of God. Yes. We thank you that we live by the rhema. We live by the revelation of the Word of God. We thank you, Father, for who you are. We thank you that your kingdom is now here. Yes. We thank you for the power and the presence of the Holy Ghost. We thank you, Father, that your angels surround us. We thank you, Father, that we stand on the rock of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, that you carry us in the palm of your hand. Not only that, but you've inscribed our names on the palm of your hand. We thank you, Father God, for who you are. We thank you that you love people. But here we are, and we're coming around Jesus Christ, the ever-living Word of God. He is the living Word of God. And we come to hear truth. We come to hear revelation. We receive revelation. We want an impartation of the Holy Spirit. But more than anything else, God, as we come around your Word, as we come in and sit at your feet, we ask that there would be a transformation on the inside of us, that we would be more and more conformed to the image of Christ that Christ would be more and more fully formed on the inside of us in Jesus' name. Amen. So Ephesians chapter 4, I'm just going to read the um, first 10 verses. And again, I've got the Amplified Classic. But I therefore, the prisoner for the Lord, appeal to you and beg you to walk a, a life worthy of your divine calling to which you've been called with a behaviour that is a credit to the summons of God's service. Living as becomes you with complete lowliness of mind, meekness, patience, bearing with one another and making allowances because you love one another. Be eager and strive earnestly to guard and keep the harmony, the oneness um, of the spirit in the binding power of peace. There is one body, one spirit, just as there is also one hope that belongs to the calling you received. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all, sovereign over all, pervading all and living in us. Yet grace and God's unmerited favour is given to each of us individually in different ways in proportion to the measure of Christ's rich and bounteous gift. Therefore it is said, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive. He led a train of vanquished foes, and he bestowed gifts on men that he ascended. Now what can this he ascended mean, but that he had previously descended from the heights of heaven into the depths and the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the very same as he who also has ascended high above all the heavens, that his presence might fill all things, the whole universe, from the lowest to the highest. Blessed be the word of God. Father, bless the word to us. Bless the word. So Ephesians, I love the book of Ephesians, and I love the book of Colossians, which are kind of like a mirror image of each other. But the first three chapters of Ephesians, we've talked about this, is purely doctrinal. It's the theology. It's, this is what you need to know to believe in a correct way. But all theology is Jesus. Jesus is the theology of the Word of God. And chapters 4 to 6 is the practical outworking of the first few chapters. So chapters 1, 2, and 3, this is the doctrine. This is what you need to know. This is so you can believe. You know, you're chosen, accepted. Um, you're blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. You once were this, but now you are this. And then he says in chapter 4, he says, now you've got to walk this out. So there's a distinct um, separation between chapters 1 to 3. This is what you need to know. Between chapters 4, 5, and 6, this is what you need to do. And it's almost like they're, they're, they echo each other, but in different ways. Like in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, it says... For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do those good works which God predestined, that we should walk in them. So there's that word walk. And then Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1 says, I, the prisoner of the Lord, appeal to you to walk worthy of the divine calling. So that word work is, you know, it's echoed. 
in verse 17 of chapter 4, it says again, So this I say and solemnly testify in the name of the Lord, that you must no longer live... Oh, I've got the wrong one, have I? But 117. You must no longer live as the heathen do in the perverseness and emptiness of their souls and the futility of their minds. He's saying you can't walk this way. But, you know, there's certain ways that you've got to walk, and you can't walk certain ways. You've got to change. Um, he says in chapter 5, verse 2, walk in love, esteeming and delighting in one another as Christ loved us and gave himself. It says walk in love. In chapter 8, it says, For you once were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. And then in verse 15, look carefully how you walk. So that word walk is all through the last last few chapters, saying it's really important that you not only know what's right, but you've also got to walk it out. This is where the rubber hits the road. This is where it says in the book of Corinthians that you are an epistle that is read by the ungodly. You might be the only Bible that they will ever read. Wow. So how we live our life, how we speak, how we interact with people can be the only epistle that they will ever read. So uh, it's recognizing how important this is. It, and another way of um, let me just double check. Another way of looking at one of the echoes that we see is in um, chapter one, verse thirteen. It says that the Holy Spirit seals us. But in Ephesians chapter four, verse thirty. It says that we are not to grieve the Holy Spirit. So, you know, we've got to know what grieves him. Like, how do I grieve the Holy Spirit? What is it that upsets him? What hinders the flow of the anointing? Mm -hmm. Ever feel sometimes like one day you've got a really strong anointing like man, you know, it's just, you know, you could lay hands on anything and it would live. Mm -hmm. And the next day, it's kind of like I can't even find the anointing. Like, what happened to it? Sometimes we live a life like a colander where it's got holes in it, and the anointing seeps out because of um, the way that we're living is not exactly what it should be. So this, this chapters four and six is really interesting. Chapters one to three is what the Holy Spirit is for us. Chapters four, five, and six is how, the whole, how we respond to the Holy Spirit. So how do you respond to the Holy Spirit? Are you even aware that he's talking to you? Do you know what he's saying? Do you sense his mood? Yes. Like, you know, like now I want to do a healing. Oh, no. Suzanne, if you just pick up the phone and talk to so-and-so. And we think, oh, I wonder what's going on with them. But we don't pick up the phone and ring. So learn to, to listen to the Holy Spirit. How do we respond to him? How do you recognize him? I know when I walk towards people, if there is an anointing on the people I'm walking towards, I sense that the Holy Spirit's involved. So I will, I will hold back or I'll turn and walk in another direction because I'm not going to interfere with what the Holy Spirit's doing in that group. So we need to be aware of the Holy Spirit. How is he, like just, just ask him, Holy Spirit, will you please teach me how to live with you? Just ask him that. So 15 times in the book of Ephesians, the Holy Spirit is mentioned. 15 times, four chapters, but 15 times. And so Ephesians chapter 1, 2, and 3, this is all about the well, who we are. Like this is who we are in Christ, accepted, <coughs> beloved, blessed, um, beloved, seated in heavenly places. And then chapters 4 and 5, this is what we are. This is what we do. This is how we live it. And then he says, now you can go to war. Now that you know who you are, now that you've got your identity squared, now that you know you can live from Christ in Christ, through Christ, by Christ, out of Christ, Christ in you, now that you know your identity, and now that you know how to live it out with family and unbelievers and how to live it out at work, now you can go to war and there won't be backlash, there won't be counterattack, there will just be victory. But quite often we go to war where we haven't got our, our relationships right, or we go to war and we don't understand that war and work are, are very closely connected. 
because they follow each other in Ephesians chapter 6. Or we can go to war not knowing who we are in Christ, not knowing that, hey, my gosh, I'm God's kid, you know. He backs me with the whole government of heaven. Yeah. So we go to war not knowing this, we get wiped out. Family gets attacked. Things happen. It's when we know who you are, when you know the strategy that God wants you to, to go to war with, when you know how to walk it out so that your relationships are right, everything else is right, so that there's no strife, no anger, no animosity, so that you're living in the peace of the fruit of the Spirit, yes. right? When you're walking in that, there is a divine protection upon you that the yes. enemy can't touch. And when you get a revelation that you're actually living in Him, Paul, right? I'm in Him. He's in me. How much do you think the enemy can actually do? Seriously. So that's why it's so important in this time with, with the spiritual warfare heating up that we know the book of Ephesians, that you know who you are in Christ. Amen. That you live it out, not because of, oh, oh what would Jesus do? Oh, I think he'd do this. No, it flows out of here. Uh -huh. Comes out of your inner being. It comes out of your spirit person. It comes out of here. Comes out of your intimacy with the Father, the Jesus, the Holy Ghost. You know, the Father's love flows through you. It's the grace of Christ that equips you, but it's the friendship and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit that takes you through. So we need to know the three of them. Yes. Right? You need to know the three. You need to know who's speaking. People say that, that um, not so much Danielle, but my other daughter and I sound very much alike on the phone, and they're not too sure who they're talking to. Well, they should know. <laughs> but it's the same with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Mm. Father would like to say something, mm. but then Jesus as my King, mm. and the Holy Spirit. How amazing that the Holy Spirit is given the assignment from God to be our helper. Yes. Yeah. That his whole assignment, God-given assignment, is to come alongside believers and say, how can I help you? Wow. And then he shows us things to come. He brings all things to our remembrance. How amazing is Holy Spirit? How amazing is he? And yet, the only sin that we can do, I guess for want of a better word, sin, um, that has no forgiveness is a sin against Holy Spirit. So we need to be a, a, a Holy Spirit, build our relationship with you. Holy Spirit, take us into the school of the Spirit and teach us how to live with you. Teach us your anointings. Teach us how to move in the gifts. Teach us about your attitudes. Teach us with the Holy Spirit. Because we don't ever want to grieve you. Yes. We don't ever want to upset you, Holy Spirit. So would you please teach us how to live with you? How do we live with you? And there is a scripture in these end times which you need to be aware of. That Holy Spirit, I have just hit over 30,000 of my... Um, things on the Holy Spirit. Just about finished my sixth book, all handwritten, scriptures, prayers, quotations, all of this. But he's also known as the spirit of war. So when you go to war, you need to know the Holy Spirit as the spirit of war. Yeah. You need to know him. And so the book of Ephesians, four chapters, 15 times the Holy Spirit is mentioned. I would say that they're trying to get across to us that it is important. Mm. Mm. So chapters 4 to 4, 1 to about 6, 9, I think, is how to, how to conduct ourselves. It's a, our relationship to fellow believers. Um, verses 17 and 25 of chapter 4, it's how, how, how to have a relationship with unbelievers. Uh, that's always interesting. Um, our relationship to the Holy Spirit is in chapter 4, verse 30, and chapter 5, verse 18. So that's chapter 4, verse 30, and chapter 5, verse 18 is our relationship and conduct to the Holy Spirit. 
from chapter 5, around about verse 22, to chapter 6, verse 9, it is the believer's relationship and conduct to home and family. Do we, you know, husbands, do you really love your wives as Christ loved the church? And wives, do you respect your husband as you would respect the Lord? And then in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 20, it is believers' relationship to the enemy in a wartime. Do you understand war? Do you understand that there's really only four levels? I'm going to talk about this on Tuesday at KI. There's only four levels of warfare. There's only four things, like four levels. We think it's, it's all of this, but really you can boil it down to four. And when you recognise what those four levels are and what they affect in life, you really then know what you need to release. A bit pointless releasing light against a principality if it's a spiritual blindness that's at work. So you need to be able to recognise what this is. So in chapter 4, verse 1, this is Paul. And remember, he is a prisoner when he writes this. But he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, or the prisoner for the Lord. So it didn't matter. Rome thought he was their prisoner. Mm. But he wasn't their prisoner. He was, he was Jesus' yeah. prisoner. Have you been imprisoned by Christ? Has he so got your heart that you are his love slave? And Paul puts that before being an apostle. I am a bond slave Come on. of the Lord called to be an apostle. But first and foremost, he says, he's a bond slave. He's a love slave to the Lord. Imprisoned. In his, his captivated, if you use a better word than imprisoned, captivated by his relationship with Jesus, with Yeshua. Have you lost your first love? Because that's what happened to the book of, to the Ephesus church in Revelation. They had lost their first love. This is so important. And he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, appeal to you, I beg you to walk worthy of the calling to which you've been called. The Amplified says, with a behavior that is a credit to the summons to God's service. But walk worthy of the calling. What is the calling? You know what we do? We're so full of ourselves that we think the calling is our destiny. We think it's what God's called us and what my destiny is, what God's called me to do. Secondary, the first call is you are called to live for Christ. That is your first calling. To walk worthy of the calling that God has called you to walk as a servant of Christ, as a child of God. Your destiny, 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 your destiny <laughs> is secondary. Destiny is secondary. <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say? First yes. and foremost, you are called right. by God to follow right. Jesus, right? That's your first call. Yes. Destiny is second. But we think, oh, I've got to walk worthy of the call to which I've been called. My call is apostle. My call mm. is business. Mm. My call is. No! First and foremost, I'm called yeah. to be a child of God. Yeah. To be a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. To honor Him. First calling. Every other call that's on your life, whether it's fivefold ministry, business, homemaker, whatever it is, secondary. I'm not even going to try to say destiny, secondary. Destiny. Yeah, destiny, destiny, secondary. This is what it's about. Your first call is to be like Paul. I'm imprisoned by the Lord. Wow. So captivated by Him. So oh, wrapped in His presence. So caught up in the heavenlies with Him that nothing else matters. I'm His. That's your first call. Destiny flows out of that. We've really got to understand we serve a king and a kingdom. You know, um, when I went to school, we'd, we'd put our hands on our hearts and we'd say, um, or we'd sing, God bless the Queen, I think it was. God bless the Queen. I'm talking yes. like, you know, back in Noah's time. God save the Queen. God save the Queen. We don't need God to save the King because He is the King of all kings. Mm -hmm. But we do need to make sure that we live a life of allegiance to him mm -hmm. and to his kingdom. Mm -hmm. That you come before him and, and several times, and quite a few times, I've had the vision that I'm kneeling before him in a full thing of armor, mm -hmm. holding on to the sword and I'm kneeling on one knee. Yeah. I am here to execute your pleasure. Yeah. And I get my orders. 
I am here to execute your pleasure. That is your first calling. Business, charity, anything else, ministry, secondary. Because if we don't do the first one well, we're not going to do the others well. And the grace of God is on the first one first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So we understand that that, um, that is your first calling. Call to be um, to walk worthy of the call. It comes back to Romans chapter 12, verse 1, isn't it? You know that um, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you would present yourself a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice on the altar, a living sacrifice. And then it says, and as you renew your mind, and renew your mind. Do not be conformed to this world. So not conforming to this world is linked with being a living sacrifice. But the thing is, a sacrifice, we have the neck cut off. This is living. That basically means when I'm put on that altar as a living sacrifice, I don't have, own, I don't have my own will. Mm-hmm. My mind is now his mind. Mm-hmm. His will is my will. I go where he sends me. I do what he tells me to do and I speak what he tells me to speak. Living sacrifice. This is this is what it's all about. And um, and if you have a look in Colossians chapter one, verse ten. It says that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord fully pleasing to him, desiring to please him in all things, bearing fruit in every good work, and steadily growing and increasing in and by the knowledge of God. That you may walk in a manner worthy of him, fully pleasing him, desiring to please him in all things. And then if you head across to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, Verse 12, to live lives worthy of God. Let me start at verse 11. For you know how, as a father dealing with his children, we used to exhort each of you personally, stimulating and encouraging and charging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and the glorious blessedness into which true believers will enter after Christ's return. So he's saying, I want you to to live a life that is worthy of God. You'll be called into his kingdom. So this is your first, this is your first call. This is it. You've got to know Jesus intimately. See, the thing is, we have to represent Jesus in the world, right? Well, sometimes I am fully aware that I don't represent him well. I'm task focused instead of people oriented. I'm caught up with what I've got to do instead of caring about what's on their hearts. Selfishness. I repent. But you know me. So it's it's recognizing that we have to we have to live worthy of him. Cannot do it in our own strength. Can't do it in my own power. Can't do it because I'm willing to do it or want to do it. It's a yielding to the grace of God, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and the truth of his word. But this is is what you've been called to. So the destiny is important, but it's secondary. Mm -hmm. This is your first call. So I know sometimes, you know those funny mirrors that you see at at carnivals and, you know, showgrounds and all of that, you stand in front of it and you're all kind of wavy or you've got the big head and the skinny body or the other way around. Sometimes I think I represent Jesus like one of those mirrors. You know, the head's too big and the body's too small or it's it's all kind of, you know, it's not straight, it's not a pure reflection of the glorious majesty of my King. And what does that mean? It means that I don't know him very well in that area. It means that I haven't died to self in that area. It means that God needs to work on me in that area. Because I want to represent my King well. I want to be a true reflection of who He is as much as He can work in me. 
And as he can do anything, he can do that. Mm -hmm. and, and you can hear the cry of Paul in Galatians chapter 4, verse 19, where Paul says, I travail until Christ is fully formed in you. He said, I intercede until the fullness of Christ is formed in you. I want to recognize being the only, what do you call it, epistle that a lot of unbelievers read. I don't want them reading a false gospel. Yeah, that's right. Mm. That's right. Mm. I want them to see the truth and the love and the power of God. So we need to know Jesus well in order to accurately represent him. You know, when Paul was converted, you know, when he was knocked off his high horse in Acts chapter 9, in verse 5 he asked a question, Who are you, Lord? Mm. And then in verse 6 was the second question, What do you want me to do? So the first question is, what's basically doctrinal? Who are you? What, who am I supposed to believe in? This is the doctrinal thing. But then the second question, what do you want me to do? This is how he wanted to, how do I work this out in my life? Who are you and how do I, how do, I do what you want me to do? And that's, the, that's how you see it all through Paul's letters. First the doctrine, then the outworking. First the belief. So let me tell you what theology is. Theology is Jesus Christ. Yes. Mm. Theo means God. Theology is all about Jesus. Jesus must be the theology you believe in. You must see Jesus in everything. It comes back to Jesus, the resurrected King. If it wasn't about his death on the cross, if it wasn't his stripes by which we're healed, his blood that was shed, his sealing of the covenant on our behalf, You've got to recognize that it's about Jesus Christ. If you want to know what theology is from the Garden of Eden right through to Revelation, it is Jesus Christ. It is nothing else but Jesus, and we need to know who he is. And we need to work out the call of God upon our lives that we are to, to have, uh, we are called to an allegiance to our King and to his kingdom. We are called by grace that he will equip us to serve him. It's his grace that equips us. And then we, he has given us a unity within the body of Christ, which he is saying, appreciate the unity. And then he says, I want you to guard it and keep it. And so this unity is, and we're going to be talking about this because this turns up. But first and foremost, he says, we've got to have a, an undivided allegiance so that we can walk worthy of the Lord. Because Jesus Christ conquered death itself, didn't he? So he conquered, whatever Jesus did, in John chapter 14, verse 12, it says, whatever Jesus did, you will do also, and greater works than this. So can you see yourself doing the works of Jesus Christ? Can you see yourself maybe walking on water? Yeah. Have you tried it? <laughs> Lay hands on the sick and see them recover. Raise the dead. We've had one person raised in, in, in my, my grandson was raised. Um, but, you know, but, but you've got to see Christ in you, Christ living in you. You've got to see this. Um, so it, it talks about a complete loyalty, uh, a yielding completely to him. And then he says, living with complete humility. So he says, this, if you want to know what the call is like, these are the four virtues that you're going to have to walk in. He says, you're going to have to live with complete humility and meekness, and patience and forbearance. Without those things, you cannot follow Jesus. Mm -hmm. So that lowliness, that humility, that honouring others above yourself, recognising what honour is. Husbands and wives honouring each other. Mothers and fathers and children honouring each other. Recognising what honour is, which in Australia we don't do very well. Mm. But recognising what honour is. Recognising that and, and living accordingly. That's the humility. But the, and, and living low at the Master's feet. That's humility. But the meekness is not being a doormat. Right. The meekness is not being nice because there's no anointing on nice. The meekness is Christ's perfect power in you under perfect control. That's what, that's what meekness is. Perfect power under perfect control. Because that's what Jesus Christ had. He was meek. Perfect power. He had all the power of God at his disposal. He could call in the angels. But it was always under his control. Perfect power under perfect control. That means we can't run off at the mouth. I can't have a short temper. Well, you know, at times it's there. 
But do you not understand what I'm saying? Perfect power under perfect control. Meekness is not a doormat. Meekness is not um, being nice. Meekness is recognizing that you could cop down and drop some fire. Yeah. But not today. <laughs> but you will still get a chance. <laughs> but it's recognizing what these things. Long suffering is a patience, a joyful patience that endures. Patience means it might take a time. Please let me tell you something. Never, 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 never pray for patience. <laughs> Don't ever pray for it. Just recognize it's a fruit of the spirit, let it mature on the inside, but never ask for it, okay? <laughs> but then the, the last one is forbearance. We've got to learn to bear with one another. There are times it's really easy to get along with people. There are times and sometimes it's on and off. And there are times when you think, oh, but we have to bear with yes, one another. that's true. Right? Learn to bear with one another. Maintain the unity mm. and maintain the peace. The minute you allow strife in, you allow all sorts of evil. So the four virtues to live out your calling is humility, meekness, long-suffering, and forbearance. How joyful is this message? <laughs> but enduring, right? But he's saying, like, guys, you guys, you know, you know who you are in Christ now. So this is what it looks like when you when you live. This is what it looks like now in your day-to-day -day life. <laughs> In verse 3, he says, Be eager and strive earnestly to guard and keep the harmony and the oneness by the Spirit in the binding power of peace. He said, You've got to strive earnestly to keep the harmony, the unity, the oneness that is produced by the Spirit in the power of peace. Could you just this, say that one more time? A bit slower. Be eager and strive earnestly to guard and keep the harmony the unity, the oneness Whoa. of the Spirit in the power of peace. So it's the Holy Spirit that does the unifying. Mm -hmm. And any time we disrupt the unity, mm, we're disrupting the Holy Spirit. Yeah. We're grieving Him. Mm. This is uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3. Be eager, strive earnestly to guard and to keep the harmony, the oneness, the unity which has been produced by the Spirit in the binding power of peace. Celebrate unity. You know, like there's lots of people that find me like a bit like Peck's Paste, you know, like a little bit goes a long way. But there's other people that really enjoy my company. <laughs> But you know what I mean? I will not know the fullness of God yeah. or be able to accomplish what He's called me to accomplish without you. And you can't do it without me. Or right. whoever God puts in your life. That's right. <laughs> That's right. True. So He says, I want you to maintain the unity. I think maintain the unity. I'll just go on. Wow. He's called me to midnight prayer. So if I disrupt the unity, I'm disrupting or grieving the Holy Spirit. Mm. But if I disrupt the unity, I'm also being like a cancer cell in the body of Christ. Mm. Mm. Nobody wants I'm stopping life, I'm stopping health, I'm stopping growth. We are one body. 
cell to cell, we connect with each other. That's why the Bible says, when one of you cries, you cry. When somebody laughs, you laugh. It affects all of us. We are one body. It's not just Open Heaven Ministries or Glow or Elevate or any of the other churches around here. We are one body. Right? We've got different expressions, but we are one body. And he says, I want you to maintain the unity. He says, I want you to overcome and demolish and put behind anything that speaks of disunity. So I can say things that people might not agree with. You can say, I don't agree with Suzette on that. That's absolutely fine. But I do agree with Suzette on the fact that we are one in the body. Yes. I do agree with Suzette on the fact that it's Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Yes. I do agree on the Word of God. So find, you, find that common level of, deno- of denomination. Is it denominator? Lowest level of denominator. Lowest level. I'll go home. Lowest, 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 lowest denominator. Level denominator. Lowest common denominator. denominator. Lowest common denominator. Build on that and, and let the Holy Spirit do it. But the minute that we get uptight about it, it means that we're out of the spirit, we're in the soul. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You're not to judge, but you are to discern the fruit. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So he says, you know, um, we're already joined because the thing is, the Father sees each and every believer as his children. He sees each of us as his children. Yeah. <coughs> He is, the, he is the Father. Matthew 16, you know, God's kingdom has come. God's will be done on earth as it is yes. in heaven. And if I can just find the scripture back in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. For Christ himself is our peace. This is out of the Amplified. Christ himself is our peace and our bond of unity and harmony. He has made us both, Jew and Gentile, one body. And he has broken down, destroyed and abolished the hostile dividing wall between us. By abolishing in his own crucified flesh the enmity caused by the law with its decrees and ordinances which he annulled, that he from the two might create in himself one new man. That's the unity, one new man. Man. Remember, there's neither male nor female. There's not Greek or Jew. There's not barbarian or, or we're all one in Christ. And the Holy Spirit is saying, because Christ did it, and the Holy Spirit defends it, you've got to guard this. When these letters were written, there were all lots of different little churches throughout Ephesus. It was just the one church in Ephesus, the Ephesus, Ephesians church. Mm. The Corinthian church, the Philippian church, the Thessalonican church. Mm-hmm. That's right. But then there was just the one church. But when in, um, and then things started to fall apart with Constantine. And then we've got in the 1600 with Luther, there's the Great Reformation, and all sorts of things fell apart. There's Protestants and Catholics, and there's Puritans, and all sorts of things started to fall apart. And now there's thousands and thousands of different labels that we tag upon ourselves, um, different religious labels that we tag. But if you want to come down to it, you know what open heaven is? Apart from the fact that we live under an open heaven, we are disciples of Jesus Christ. You can, you can, you know, Pentecostal because we speak in tongues, but why limit ourselves to Pentecostal? I follow Jesus. That's it. I follow Jesus. I belong to the one body. I follow Jesus along with every other believer. I follow Jesus. We cannot afford. And I'm I'm speaking as an ex-Catholic because I found Christ in in a Catholic charismatic group. But born again, I got spirit filled, saw angels, heard angels, and saw miracles, amazing things happen. That was my foundation. And then to come across into Pentecostal churches and find out that some people wouldn't even speak to me because I was ex-Catholic. Wow. And, and, and I understand it's not a perfect church. No church is. Yes. That's right. But we are followers of Christ. Yes. Yeah. We are disciples of Jesus. Mm-hmm. Tags are simply human tags trying to explain something about why they are who they are. We just follow Jesus. Can we just settle with that? Yeah. And then he says, 
um, there is one in verse 4. He goes on to talk about the unity. He says, there is one body and one spirit. Just as there is also one hope that belongs to the calling that you've received. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all, sovereign over all, pervading all, living in all of us. So he says, it's one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God who is the Father. One. He says, that's the unity we've got to come back to. That's what we've got to protect, you know, that unity. We are in one body. We're all bound together in peace by the Holy Spirit, the one spirit. We all have the hope of our calling that is revealed to us in Revelation and what's coming. And we have one Lord and his name is Jesus Christ. We have one faith that pleases God because we seek him. Uh, we have one, well, actually, there is one baptism, but there's different forms of baptism, water baptism. Um, Jesus went through a baptism of suffering. There's the baptism into the Holy Spirit and fire. But in reality, he's talking about the baptism. When you got born again, you were baptized into the body of Christ. That's the baptism. And he says, there's one God who is also your Father. Keep the unity. Keep the unity. Keep the unity. See, God creates, I mean, just all the creation to see how diverse everything is, all the colours and, and everything that he makes, and, 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 and then look at all the people and all the different gifts that people have. Some have so created that they, they're paintings and, and other people make things and build things or, or are intellectual. Everybody's so amazingly different. Everybody's got the most amazing gifts that God's given them, and yet all of it is to come together into the unity of the body of Christ. It's keeping the unity. It's oneness. Oneness with each other, and oneness with the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Oneness with each other. What happens to you affects me. What affects me affects you. And oneness with the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We need each other. Yeah. Yeah. See, the beautiful thing is, I can, I can know God in one way, and then Marianne or Leah will say something, and I think, oh, I haven't thought about that. Yeah. I haven't seen God in that way. Yeah. So it sends me to my Bible, and it drops me to my knees in prayer. I say, God, I want to know you like they do in this area. Yeah. I've never thought about it. Will you show me that? And, and somebody might hear something from me that they haven't thought about, and then they'll go, God, so we need each other because when we come together, there's a wholeness of God yes. that starts to take place. It's not just a Pentecostal thing. It's not just a pastor thing. It is a body of Christ thing where Christ is being revealed in all of his glory. And we are seeing him like this multifaceted diamond, like this amazing jewel. Oh my gosh, look at this facet. Oh, look at that facet. Oh my goodness, I've never seen this. And no wonder in Revelation they're crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And every time, you know, every time they go around the throne, holy, holy, holy. Because they're seeing something new. They're seeing something in you they've never seen before. And in all of eternity, we will not end up ever knowing the fullness of God.
I don't want him oh. to visit us like he visited Sodom and Gomorrah.
that is your God and Father. Come on. So in areas, you know, where you're facing a few challenges, it's really okay to say, Father, would you father me through this? Yes. I have often said, Father, mm. family, is it getting out of, getting out of control? Mm -hmm. yeah. Would you please come oh, in yes. and, and sort out yes. the family? Yes. You're the father. Because mm -hmm. he's the father of all families in heaven yes. and on earth. Yes. But this is a time of rich growth. Mm. Yes. It's a time of deep holiness. Yes. The richness of his grace. Mm. And big growth. Because he has assignments for all of you. Mm -hmm. He has assignments for us as a, as a body. But we need to know who we are. And who he is. Yeah. So we can live it out. And we can be like the walkers, rowdy ones around the throne. Yeah, and on. just go, holy, 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 hol